always loved the ocean. Growing up in Vancouver, I was surrounded by water. The ocean was a part of every family trip. Throughout my life, the ocean has seemed constant, unchanging, immense, always there to give. But recently, I've been hearing that the oceans are in trouble. The shellfish industry here is struggling. They first started noticing baby scallops dying a few years ago. The culprit, lethally acidic seawater. In the last few years, the local scallop industry lost millions of dollars worth of stocks due to something called ocean acidification. The same thing has been happening in the Pacific Northwest of the US. I want to know what's going on. This idea of acidification is, it, this is a tough one for me to understand because the water doesn't feel acid. Like it doesn't, it doesn't burn me when I stick my hand in it. So what, what does that mean when you say acidification? It's not acid, but it's a little bit more acid than it was. It's less alkaline if you want to put it that okay, way. Okay, so what is going on here? Well, the best science that's coming out sort of points at climate change as being the problem. The oceans are becoming more acidic. When we emit CO2 into the atmosphere, it's absorbed through the surface of the ocean and it reacts with seawater to change the chemistry of the ocean. The tailpipe emissions from my car go up into the air, go into the water, and that's what's causing the acidification. That is absolutely correct. So we have put enough carbon, we've burned enough fuel to literally change the composition of the, of the world's oceans. It's hard to believe. Yeah, it it's hard really to believe. hard to believe. That change can affect mussels, clams, oysters. That's right. The major thing it does, it makes it more difficult for all those animals that make some sort of a shell to create those shells. In Vancouver, there's been a real problem with the scallop industry, and if you move down to Washington, there's been problems with the oyster industry as well as clams in California and other places as well. Let's fast forward 50 years. My son's here talking to your son, if, if you have a son. Maybe there's no more scallop industry because we failed to do anything about climate change. That's not good. That's not good, but it gets even worse. Ocean acidification is not the only problem. The oceans are a huge heat sink. 90% of the global warming that has gone on on the planet is stored in the ocean. That's where all the heat is from global warming. Wow. Every person on Earth depends on the oceans for life itself. And coral reefs, for example, are an extremely important part of that. Global warming and ocean acidification are sort of like a double whammy for corals in the tropics. If you head to the Great Barrier Reef, you're going to see major changes in the reefs that are related to ocean warming and acidification. It's hard for me to imagine that climate change has altered the entire ocean system. I need to see this for myself. The best place to see the impacts of climate change on the oceans is in Australia, at the Great Barrier Reef. It's the world's largest coral reef system. So big, you can see it from space. I'm headed to its southern reaches, to a place called Heron Island, where scientists from the University of Queensland are doing groundbreaking research on coral reefs. Ove Hogelberg is a marine biologist who has spent his life studying corals. More and more, his focus has been on climate change and the impact it will have on the world's reefs. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Spectacular. It always pleases me when I look at a sea like this with a coral reef and fish and sharks. It's just and the reefs from above. It hides all that biodiversity. And the only way to see it is to get in the water and, and have a look. Heron Island is surrounded by some of the most pristine coral reefs in the world. Before I see how climate change will affect them, Ove wants to show me what's at stake.
I've been a diver since I was a teenager, but what greets me under the surface of the water blows my mind. The Great Barrier Reef is one of the seven natural wonders of the world, and I can see why. I have never seen this kind of diversity in life, or been this close to a majestic manta ray. Being eye to eye with these animals is humbling. I'm realizing how interconnected everything is. And when I look closer, I see that reefs are supporting all of this life providing food, shelter, and places to hide from predators. It turns out coral reefs punch way above their weight in productivity. Though they make up less than 1% of the ocean floor, reefs support a quarter of all marine species. If climate change will alter the reefs, is all this life under threat? The major problem is that we've assumed that the ocean is too big to fail. We've assumed we can fish the fish uh, and always have more fish. We've assumed that we can put pollution into the ocean and it'll just go away and not come back and won't build up. But what we've learned over the last uh, 50 years is that the ocean is finite, that there are limits to what it can absorb. At the moment, it's showing all the signs that it's on wobbly legs. How is it trying to tell us? Like, what are the signs? It's an ocean which it hasn't been this warm or changing temperature for thousands of years. And we're seeing a change in the chemistry of the ocean that has no parallel in 65 million years, if not 300 million years. That's the last time it changed this quickly. They often refer to ocean acidification as the evil twin of global warming, right? Because it's, it's a separate but very potent effect. But we only started to learn about it 15 years ago, so we really only know the tip of the iceberg and here's right. the kicker. It takes 10,000 years or more to reverse the changes that we've made already. That's the size. It's astonishing, number. It's astonishing isn't yeah. it? Power of society. Ove explains to me that we've pumped more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than there's ever been in human history. Scientists knew that this added CO2 was warming the oceans along with the rest of the planet. But what they only recently discovered was that about a third of it ends up in the ocean. There, it combines with seawater to create a dilute acid. And here's the truly shocking part. Today's ocean is already 30% more acidic than it was before the Industrial Revolution. What I want to know is what those changes mean for our future. And Ove says he can show me. He and his colleagues at the University of Queensland have created an experiment that shows what the future might look like. You're looking at an experiment we've been running over the last 12 months, and this experiment has been exposing uh, parts of coral reefs to uh, warmer and more acidic oceans. So this is a tank where we've done nothing. Coral's growing, there are corals competing with each other. It's a normal natural reef. What we hope, and I think what we're seeing here, is that reefs will survive. And in relative good health. And relatively good health. So the health. water in here is the water that's out here. These are the coral species that you find out here. Exactly and the same. And if we were able to keep these reefs in, mm. in the water as it stands right yep. now... If we don't stack the odds against them, they will survive. But of course, what we've been doing is adding CO2 to the water and acidifying the ocean. We've been heating the upper layers. And of course, that's what we've got in those other tanks. To see how climate change will impact corals, Ove and his team have exposed the exact same reef species to a variety of future conditions. In this tank, we've just changed the acidity levels, adding CO2 to the water. The scientists working on this project have discovered that although they look well, when you actually look at the process at which they build their skeletons, it's all proceeding a lot slower. And they've almost got a form of osteoporosis. Right. Now, that's important because um, 
if you have a storm come through, these corals are going to break more easily. And in terms of growing back, they're going to take a lot longer. And so when you look at this next tank, where the same reef, same number of corals and other organisms, but now exposed to 12 months of four degrees Celsius above um, where it is today. So it's a warmer uh, ocean. And what you see here is that uh, most of the corals are dead. Any coral that survived is bleached. Wow. You can it's see that. dramatic, yeah. frankly. Ove tells me that coral is actually an animal and that inside its tissue, there are tiny brown algal-like organisms that provide up to 90% of the coral's energy. When the water gets too warm, the coral expels these organisms, becoming a ghostly white. That's bleaching. The coral is still alive, but if conditions don't return to normal quickly, the coral could die from starvation. And then the other thing is that it's being dominated by cyanobacteria or, or, or slime. It's pretty ugly. So we've changed the acidity, we've changed the temperature, but what happens when we change both? Oh my God. This to me looks like death. Truly shocking. It's truly shocking. But it's and you'll find it's really brittle if you it's touch a, it, you know? Oh yeah, right. So the corals are breaking down as well. Even after the coral itself has died. That's right. The skeleton that gets left over is being eaten by the water, literally. Absolutely. The stuff that we're not seeing is not that you didn't put it in here, it's that it's dissolved. It's gone. It's gone. And it's even, this. Yep, it's sand. We thought that would take a lot longer. It's, it's so horrific to watch. Of, yeah, it is horrific. Yeah. I, I mean, this is, a, it's, this is a truly shocking visual from coming no, from there. it really is. This, this is what happens. It's, 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 a, it's an emotional experience for me as a scientist to, to look at this and realize that the animal that I, that I study isn't part of the future. And that's the future we're on right now. Keep pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. This is what we're going to get. Would all of these beautiful tropical reef fish, which are the basis of the food chain, would they be able to survive in an environment like this? Many species will either become extremely rare or go extinct. We have to decarbonize in the next few decades or face the worst of times. Is this what our future holds? The difference between the thriving reefs I dived in and the sludgy mess I've just seen is frightening. Looking out on this pristine ocean, it's hard to believe that humans alone could drastically alter something so vast and ancient. But I've learned not to be fooled by surface appearances. The oceans are more delicate and fragile than they seem, especially the reefs, the nursery for all that life. It's clear we are running out of time. My question is, how long have we got? This year is the warmest on record. And with ocean temperatures reaching dangerously high levels, a major coral bleaching event is predicted to hit the Great Barrier Reef. It's a race against time to document these reefs before climate change alters conditions here. The XL Catlin Sea View Survey uses cameras to take high numbers of 360 degree photographs of the bottom of the sea, effectively mapping the seafloor like Google Street View maps land. With this technology, scientists are able to establish a baseline for the coral reefs so that after a bleaching event, they can figure out how much was actually lost. It's part of the largest visual stock take of corals on the planet ever done. And after today's dives, I'm actually feeling hopeful the reefs here are thriving. But then I learned my optimism may be misplaced. 
Ove has footage from other reefs around the world. And he says what's happening there will eventually happen here too. Now, this is largely a healthy reef. Right. Now, if you look at a reef that's under stress, like this one here. And there's bleaching all over the place. Right, that's what all these white patches are. That's right, it looks like it's snowed underwater. <laughs> right. So some of that might recover if it gets cooler sooner. Uh, but a lot of that will die either directly or it'll die of starvation or disease. So if you look at, look at the healthy reef on the left-hand side right. with reefs that have now started to bleach, like the one on the right. And we're talking, and wow, wow. That's only a couple of months of it being under that stress. It is, it's surprising to see how quickly it happens. That is shocking. The first time people saw you know, a mass bleaching event was in the early 1980s, and, and never before then. But in 1998, we had the first global event. But then you go to 2010 and it happens again. 2015, 2016, and it's happening again. And all that while, it appears that the interval between these events is shortening and their intensity is increasing. We're now in the third global mass bleaching event. This year, we had very warm conditions coming into the summer, plus a strong El Nino. And that then pushed sea temperatures, you know, right to the limit over right. most of the reef. Yeah. Looks like it's in real deep, deep trouble mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. So up to this bleaching event, mm -hmm. how much of the world's corals were lost? In the Caribbean, uh, it's very clear that we have lost probably 80% of corals since the 1970s. Hold um, on, 80% of the corals in the Caribbean are already gone? That's right. I think you can safely say that we've probably lost 40 to 50% of corals across the planet in the last 50 years. Yeah. Within 20 or 30 years time, you don't have coral anymore. To be clear, if we continue down even the current path, if we just continue as we're going right now, coral reefs will cease to exist by mid-century of this century. Yep, 35 years from now. Because we're just putting so much stress on them and they're going backwards. <laughs> I'm sorry, the, I'm, this, that's astonishing. That's astonishing. I've got used to it. <laughs> you know, I know, it's amazing that you have, but... No, and I, I think there's a bit of battle fatigue among scientists who've sure. been trying to communicate this to people that coral reefs are under extreme threat of disappearing. What I see next makes me realize how close this threat is. Footage coming in from the northern sections of the Great Barrier Reef shows widespread bleaching already underway. That's, that, is, um, that is far worse than I thought it was. In some regions, Parts of the reef have already died and been taken over by the slime that Ove showed me in his future scenario tanks. One of the seven natural wonders of the world is disappearing before our eyes, and with it, the support system for millions of sea creatures. There's just no hope in hell. Yeah, that's, that's pretty shocking. The thing that's sort of tragic about this is that they are important to humans as well. Coral reefs do directly support 500 million people across the planet. You've only got to go to the Philippines to see people living almost desperately on a vanishing ecosystem along those coastlines. But this is life and death in some of these countries. I was later to find out 93% of the Northern Great Barrier Reef was impacted by bleaching. How much will recover is unknown. It's devastating to know that if I ever have kids, they may never see or experience these reefs. But what I'm coming to realize is it's not just marine creatures at risk. People will suffer too. So I'm heading to the Philippines, to a region known as the Coral Triangle, where humans have relied on coral reefs for thousands of years. There 
are parts of the world for which coral is a lifeline. In the Philippines, it's easy to see. The ocean provides. It's not just food and income. It's a way of life. sit at the apex of the coral triangle, often referred to as the Amazon of the seas. This area contains the most biodiverse oceans in the world. A staggering amount of marine species lives here, and there are more types of coral than anywhere else on Earth. I've come here to learn more about the relationship between people and coral reefs. So here we are. This is the fish market. <laughs> All right. Rene Hunter-Real is a scuba instructor and teacher of economics at Silliman University. Um, you've got snapper here, you've got right. jack, crustaceans, some tuna. Right. Any, uh... You're so handsome. <laughs> <laughs> you said that fish in general is 80% of the Filipino the diet. The middle income and lower incomes diet. Every day, every municipality, is doing exactly every morning this. you got this, yeah. Wow, 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 wow. It's not yet 7 a.m. and the market is packed. Rene says it'll be like this all day. It's clear the demand for seafood is huge, but things are changing. You're saying that the fishermen are reporting that these stocks are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So catch, like the yield is smaller and the actual fish themselves the are getting smaller. The actual fish size is getting smaller, the yield is much wider. It's much harder to catch. Not only that, but the types of fish available at the market are changing too. Especially these. Right. These are very bony, very small, but they're very cheap. And so four or five years ago, you wouldn't see these at all. They'd be just something the fishermen would give away or the fishermen would eat there. Eat there, right, right, right. Where There's no are. point in bringing them to market. No, no one would buy them. <laughs> Rene says overfishing and pollution are taking a huge toll on the region. But climate change threatens to make things much worse. And all this puts pressure on the reefs in a place that depends on them. The weather patterns are really... What's the population, do you think, that's sort of living around and, and surviving off of the coral reefs? Coast-wise, people living on the coast in the Philippines, about 64 million, 65 million people. Large portion is below the poverty line. Yeah. So if those stocks go away, there is no other source of protein, no other affordable source. No other affordable right. source. That's a good, that's a good point. The uh, contribution of coral reefs or the marine system to the Philippine economy is something like a billion U.S. dollars. We're just talking the Philippines here. So when you look into the future and you think about climate change and the effects on, on in your little slice of paradise here, what are your concerns? Like, what keeps you up at night? I'm concerned there won't be any more coral reefs left. There won't be any fish. There won't be a tourism industry. There won't be food for 60, 70 percent of the people. So you're talking about a potential like massive, massive crisis for 60 percent of the of the Filipino population. Wow. I'm concerned that people aren't taking it that seriously. If what I saw in Australia is headed here, Rene is right to be concerned. Rene wants to show me some of the Philippines' famous reefs. He's taken me to his favorite dive spot, Apo Island. The marine reserve here has some of the healthiest corals in the country. Protected from overfishing and pollution, the reserves shelter the reefs from at least some of the assaults on the sea. The reefs in the Philippines are every bit as beautiful as those I saw in the Great Barrier Reef. But here, I'm looking at them with different eyes. They're a source of food, not just for all the sea life down here, but for people too. In the quiet calm, I'm struck by the enormity. It's no wonder that mankind looked at the ocean and thought it would last forever. 
but already there are signs things are changing. And after seeing a mostly thriving coral reef, Rene leads me to something else. Five years ago, a storm tore through parts of the marine reserve surrounding the island, and this is the result. Weakened by bleaching, the coral reefs were more susceptible to harm than ever before. In just hours, a reef that took thousands of years to flourish and grow was wiped out. I can't help but think of Ove's future scenario tanks on Heron Island. Those grim predictions seem already true. Could this be the future of all coral reefs? Nothing but rubble and a few small reminders of the life and beauty that once existed? Has that level of destruction always been a part of the local ecosystem or is that something new that you see that just complete destruction of an entire reef? I can say that it's just started to spike and accelerate in the last five years. The coral is under assault from a variety of different things. So the coral gets a little bit weaker, the storms get a little bit stronger and suddenly you end up with what we oh, saw, so just total decimation under the water. Right, right. Those are already protected areas. They're healthier than most of the reefs. Normal reefs. So yeah. if they have a hard time with that damage, then what more a reef rest. that's under other stresses? To go from the, the annihilated portion that we saw back to healthy, how long does that take to grow? Decades, centuries worth of coral wiped uh, out in two hours. Centuries, yeah. Whoa. Um, it's enough to bring tears to your eyes. Uh, Cam. I have to say, it's tremendously depressing to know that there's not a chance that that's coming back well, in your or my lifetime or your kid's lifetime that we're hundreds of years away from that piece of the ecosystem being returned to something that would be healthy. It's something that affects everyone. It's more than just a few fish going away. It's more than just a bit of beautiful postcard picture. Right. Just the destruction there represents not just the destruction of reef, but families right. in trouble. Right. Through frequent dive trips to Apo Island, Rene has befriended many of the locals. Senan is a third generation fisherman who has spent his entire life on the island living off its resources. He and his son Jory make daily trips to spear fish for the family. Rene tells me there's no better way to understand the importance of the reefs to the people here than to watch them at work. With the simplest homemade equipment, Senon and Jory dive to depths of several meters, holding their breath for minutes at a time. It's beautiful to watch. This father and son are so in tune with the ocean, they almost look like they belong underwater. But the fish they're hunting for are nowhere to be found. After a day in the water, Zenon and Jory have invited us back for a meal. Apo Island has a small population, and there are few resources beyond what the sea provides. There are no cars on the island, and most people eat what they catch or grow. And Apo Island is not unusual. The Philippines is made up of more than 7,000 islands and hundreds of thousands of Filipinos live just like this. Zenon usually serves up what he finds on the reefs, but today, it's canned fish. Josh, yes, please. This would be a typical amount for four people, right? A bit more than four, maybe even. A bit yeah. more than four. This is actually yummy. Yeah, this is very yummy. <laughs> <laughs> Today when we were watching, we saw that there wasn't really much for you to catch there. Yeah. 
So this is not fresh fish. These are canned fish. Does that happen a lot? Nay tulu. Nay tulu. Hard long. Three days. Out of a week, sometimes no catch. Three days out of a week. Nay usahin ng wala mo yung makaon. There are meals that he they don't get. They just don't eat. Has it always been like that? Oh no. 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 So oh no, mas. Lots of fish. Used to be lots and lots of fish. Um. So then. Can they still exist off of what it what remains? They should. So, in his best case scenario, what does he want for today and what does he want for tomorrow? Parang pamilya. Parang pinabukas naman makakaon, sa sakad daw makatulo. Yan ra. Ayaw makatiwasok ng spoiler eh. Okay. Tama na. Tama na. He's out fishing every day while you're in school? Yes. When you finish with your studies there, are you going to stay on the island? Then no. Maybe. Yeah. So then, is he happy that his sons and daughters are are finding different opportunities and moving off the island, or is he sad that that way of life is broken now? Para ako mingo. Oh, he wants them back. He'd rather have them on the island. He so. wants them together. Kung nara is da completo ra on tamo. Completo ra. He'd rather there was enough fish. He'd rather they were off together. Uh, I'm, I'm tearing up. I didn't expect that answer. I mean, it breaks my heart that in his perfect world, he'd be able to draw his family back to him. But if the island won't support you, you can't stay. Yeah. Right? Thank you for having us in here. I appreciate it. Salamat kaya si nun, ha? Sure. It frustrates me that those who are contributing the least to climate change are the ones who will suffer the most. I can't help but wonder what will happen to all of the people in all of these towns all over this region when their source of food and income slowly disappears. While people in the Philippines were sleeping, what was supposed to be a minimal storm has rapidly intensified into a major typhoon. And now with little notice for preparations, the possibility of a disaster may be imminent. Back at my hotel, I'm shocked by news that a Category 4 typhoon is fast descending on the Philippines. Close to a million people are being evacuated from their homes, and the potential for large-scale devastation is huge. You know, we talk about global warming. The warmest waters in the world right now are off the central coast of the Philippines. Look at December. December is a quiet month. But the last several years with the global warming, December 2011, 2012, 2014, and now 2015. Thinking about those about to be made homeless is horrifying. As oceans warm, storms like this will become more intense. Those storms will not only wreak havoc on the land, but underwater too. I wake the morning after Typhoon Nona swept through the Philippines. To the north of us, reefs were damaged, homes were destroyed, and more than 40 people lost their lives. I want to talk to someone who can tell me what all of this destruction, both present and future, means for a population dependent on the ocean. We saw a storm pass through just north of us here, which is not traditionally your typhoon season. No. And we had a significant storm roll through. In the through. last few years, it's been like that. That there's just no predictability anymore. No predictability. Laura David is one of the leading oceanographers in the Philippines and, and part of an international team of scientists focusing on climate change. With the combination of warming and acidification against the backdrop of a population that takes most of its food out of the, the local coral. environment, the local yeah. coral reef. You either are not going to be able to find where you used to find your food, or it's just going to disappear. Yes. I don't think um, people realize the magnitude of that. Because if we can't get our food protein from the sea, we we'll start it. doing it in land. Right. And we don't have enough land. There's some serious security issues around that. Definitely. 
because once once this part of the world is hungry, I mean, where do we go? Right. You know, if you go around the coral triangle, in all the states that actually depend on the coral reefs, like Malaysia and Papua New Guinea and mm -hmm. Indonesia, it's the same problem. So you're talking then about a population of tens and hundreds of millions. I think it's about 380 million, million, maybe. People. Yeah, I think that's about the ballpark. If we don't stop what we're doing. I don't mean to laugh, but that seems, that's shocking. Wow, wow. Everything that I do in my regular life in some way contributes to this, yes. and I hope that some of the things that I do in my life are helping to mitigate it, but it does feel like we're past the age of simple choices, right, where we could do this gently. It feels like we have to make a more radical shift if we're going to maintain a life that I really enjoy living. And I'd like to someday look into the face of my children and not feel guilty for what I've, you know, the planet that I'm giving them. Yeah. It, it there are days when you almost feel helpless and catatonic, that you can't do anything about it anymore. Um, but then I see the next generation, and they, they're more aware. There's hope. I pray that there's hope. And that keeps me going. Right. Yeah. Should I have kids? If your kid can help, yes, why not? <laughs> wow. If there are more great minds, and great hearts, right. knowing where we're supposed to go. I think we can make a difference, but it has to be now. I think we think that 20 years is okay to delay, right. and it's not. It's not. So. I'm heading to Manila. From up in the air, I think of what is happening on the ground. Millions of people are fishing, buying catch at a market, we're taking tourist boats to sea. And it's not just here. This is happening all over the Coral Triangle. I wonder where they would go if they had to leave. Together, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, and Timor-Leste have a population of about 384 million. By comparison, Syria, currently in the midst of the world's biggest refugee crisis, had a pre-war population of only around 23 million. I'm wondering how the government here responds to such a looming threat to its population and what it might mean for the rest of the world. To answer that, I'm meeting with someone from the government of the Philippines. Lauren Lagarda, is a senator known for her record of protecting the environment. She is also a climate change ambassador for the UN. With ocean acidification, with the warming of the water, with the loss of fish stocks, and the massive degree of, of instability that it could potentially cause, there's a real chance that there's going to be a huge amount of human migration, right? The answer is yes. Here you have a paradox. There used to be unlimited bounties from the sea but now because of overfishing warming and acidification all of these produce a threat to meeting the basic needs of our um, countryside population the issue of climate change in the philippines for us is a national security matter it's not just environmental security it's it it affects every aspect of, of our life. lives yes and do you think it's too late it's not too late no one should be the fittest to say it's too late. It takes urgent climate action. Let's get away from fossil fuels. Let's ban coal. Let's put a carbon tax on coal. This needs to come from big polluters, namely China, India, and the United States. Uh, put together, they're more than 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Do you think that the major emitters are doing enough to mitigate their emissions? No. Do you and it's think not enough that they mitigate their own emissions. They should also assist other countries, including vulnerable nations and developed nations or the less consumptive nations who are non-emitters in the world like the Philippines, but who is suffering the most. We are so interconnected, whether it's your ocean in your side of the world or our ocean. It's your waste that should not be exported to any uh, developing to nation's anywhere. waste. Yes. I get frustrated sometimes when people don't understand why it's necessary to do these things because we are in an emergency room. 
and no time should be lost. The ocean is a lifeline for every human on Earth. The vast deep ocean gives us oxygen, food, and a temperature in which we can survive. It's a symbol of calm. The thing we look to, to take away our troubles. The seas provide so much, and nowhere is it more apparent than here. But the ocean connects us all. I'm back in the US. So often these things seem so far off, whether in time or geography. But in the Pacific Northwest, the shellfish industries continue to struggle as far south as San Francisco. In Maine, there are similar reports of dwindling oyster populations. Ocean warming is causing lobsters off the coast of Connecticut and Rhode Island to move north, devastating local economies that depend on them. Perhaps most alarming is what is happening in Florida. Ocean acidification wasn't supposed to have an effect there for another 50 to 60 years. But scientists at the University of Miami are discovering that coral is already dissolving at a rapid pace. Ocean acidification and warming, they're happening here. Confronted with the information that we are altering our oceans forever, what do you do? I want to talk to someone who can tell me if there are any solutions. Dr. Sylvia Earle is one of the world's foremost oceanographers. She's been a diver since the 50s, has broken records for deep sea exploration, and was the first female chief scientist of NOAA. Over the years, Sylvia has been witness to drastically changing seas and has dedicated her life to advocating for their protection, denouncing destructive fishing practices and ocean pollution. Maybe she can offer a way forward. I'm pretty depressed, to be perfectly honest. I didn't really think it was as dire as it is. It's easy to get depressed. <laughs> the fact is, we have changed the nature of nature. It's taken four and a half billion years of change to make Earth just right for the likes of us. But in decades, we have unraveled the very underpinnings of our life support system. It's still, even with the things that I've seen, hard for me to look at that ocean, that broad expanse that I've grown up on my entire life, and conceive that my actions can have a meaningful impact in there. Your actions times seven billion. And we should realize that we are totally connected to the natural world and our highest responsibility must be taking care of the systems that take care of us. So what can we do? How do we mitigate the effects of what I just witnessed? The more that we destroy the natural systems, the more rapid the accelerating warming will take place. So I have a map here that shows communities around the world who have made pledges to say we want this place to be protected, hope spots. But With her organization, Mission Blue, Sylvia has created a global network of hope spots, ocean areas designated for special protection. And many of those areas have become marine protected reserves, shielded from fishing and pollution. Scientific studies are beginning to show that certain marine animals may be able to adapt to the pressures of climate change. And these areas give them the best possible chance. But even now, only 4% of the ocean is protected. A little more of the ocean is protected now than it was even a few weeks ago, and the trend is very promising. President Obama made the link between full protection of a big chunk of the Pacific and climate change. In September 2016, President Obama expanded the Papahanaumokuakea Marine Reserve near Hawaii. It's going to be protected and allows us to save and study the fragile ecosystem threatened by climate change. 
In doing so, he created the largest protected area on Earth, bigger than all of the United States national parks combined. All of these protections seem like a great thing, but I don't see how any of it is going to stop the oceans from acidifying and warming. So how can these, just simply put, how can these marine protected areas uh, affect climate change? The truth is that alone, they cannot. We are at a crossroads. And our job right now, with rising CO2, is how do we stem the flow of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? If we put a price on carbon that causes people to say, oh, nature is not free. How does that then directly benefit or impact the, the state, the health of the oceans? The main thing is that it's making those generators of carbon, the burners of fossil fuels on the, the large scale, do something about it. Sylvia is telling me that the only real solution to ocean warming and acidification is the biggest solution of all, decarbonizing. And putting a price on carbon pollution will encourage people and companies to create less of it. With the degradation that you've witnessed in your own lifetime, what is it that gets you out of bed every day? How, how do you metabolize that and keep pushing forward? Well, for one thing, I have children and I have grandsons. I can see the world through their eyes. I can see where we're taking this if we keep doing what we're doing. If people ask me, what is the biggest problem facing the ocean today? The biggest problem is not what we're putting in or taking out. It's ignorance. It's ignorance. In the ocean, there's nothing there that is useless. It's all part of what makes the ocean function. And the most important thing we extract from the ocean, it's not oil, not gas, it's not fish. It's our existence. We know we can change and we have to. We can't just continue to consume the natural world and get away with it. We just cannot. We must take care of the ocean. We can do this. I went into this journey looking to understand more about the ocean I've always loved. I've learned about a crisis, complex, overwhelming. Now, every cell of my being wants to be a part of the solution. I'm going to fight for a price on carbon. And in the meantime, I'm going on expeditions with Conservation Group Oceana to help educate people on the importance of our oceans and combat the very ignorance Sylvia said was the biggest threat to our survival. Oh, oh my God. It's a small piece of the solution, and I'm going to do more. We all have our part to play. What's yours?